Hello? Okay. Luckily, some of the people who arrived late to this session are students which I'm supervising, so I'm going to eat plenty of cakes next week. Don't try to hide yourself. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the shipwreck session. My name is Deborah Zwickel, and I'm very delighted to be the chair of this session. Our first speakers will be Peter Campbell and George Kutsuflakis. I hope I pronounce it as okay. Welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the shipwreck session. I'm going to tell you about uh, recent research in the Forni Archipelago in Greece. Um, this is a project I direct together with George Kutsaflakis, who's sitting here in the second row. Um, so please speak to George afterwards um, about the project, and he can give you more insight into it. Uh, this is a project that's funded by the Honor Frost Foundation. and. Um, the original proposal that we submitted um, is kind of cringy now looking back because really all we had was some ethnographic data from sponge divers and we asked for this money to go out and look in this archipelago um, that's quite almost in the middle of nowhere. No one had really heard of Forney prior to this. It's not well known and it's a very small population that lives on the island. Uh, so it's kind of a shock that uh, the Honor Frost Foundation decided to give us the money, but I think the results kind of speak for themselves that that's one of the really, the, um, the legacies of the Honor Frost Foundation is that they go out on a limb and take a chance on projects. So we started just over two years ago in September 2015, and since then we've had three seasons and found 53 shipwrecks. Um, the remains of a, a early Christian sunken village, foundations that are um, in the sea, some anchorages, uh, and a bunch of anchors of different types, but uh, significantly three archaic stone anchor stocks. Uh, Forni is located near Samos and Ikaria. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit later about why we think so many wrecks are there, um, but it, there never were any major settlements on the island. Uh, this is our setup there. I'll talk a little bit about field methods, just because I know some people are interested in what we're doing and how we're doing it. Uh, we have a conservation facility set up uh, in the city center, and we have... Um, and we, have, uh, and we mostly operate based on ribs, and that allows us to get around the island quite quickly and easily and uh, inspect dive sites. Uh, so as I said, we use a lot of ethnographic data from sponge divers as well as local fishermen. Uh, the local free divers and fishermen have been uh, uh, an incredible assets to this research. Uh, and we connect the sites that they tell us based on, uh, with traditional dive survey methods, uh, and we started doing remote sensing uh, and ROV work. And we've been gathering our data in iDig, which is an app developed by the uh, Athenian Agora Excavations and uh, seems to have some great applications for maritime archaeology as well, which Christos and some others have been using. And um, uh, we, we just started using it two years ago. And we're documenting everything with photogrammetry and photo mosaics, uh, as well as bringing up things. So these are the diving conditions. So we're looking up at the surface. Uh, the diver is about 45 meters. And then we're looking down to about 70 or 80 meters. So incredible visibility. And as you can see, quite a uh, dramatic landscape. So we have 53 shipwrecks uh, that span from the Archaic uh, into the early modern period, um, including one that uh, is a wreck full of cooking pots. So if there's any cooking pot experts out there, please come see us. Uh, and as you can see, they're kind of spread all over the island, but we've only covered about 50% of the area with diver surveys, so we expect to find many more. So many of the areas that are gaps may be areas where we haven't um, uh, searched yet. So we expect the total number of shipwrecks to increase significantly. I'm just going to take a snapshot because I can't talk about all 53 shipwrecks. So I'm just going to discuss Aspercavos. So Aspercavos is a cape uh, on the main island. Uh, it's these white cliffs, uh, and we have six shipwrecks concentrated in a very small area. Uh, so this is what the cliffs look like. Um, they are just off of the main channel in between Akari and Samos, and you pass by here if you're going north-south. And just for a sense of scale, that's the rib there. So big dramatic cliffs that offer great shelter from the winds. Uh, Aspercavos is fascinating. It's one of the first places we looked. Uh, one of the sponge divers... Uh, took us along the cliffs. He hadn't been there in 35 years. 
he went back and forth and he said, right here, dive. And we dove in and we found um, three shipwrecks on that first dive, uh, and we've since found three more. And you can actually dive if you have enough air and you don't mind the depth. Um, you can actually dive from the 6th century BC all the way to the 7th century AD in a straight line. It's quite an am amazing place. So our oldest wreck uh, is a type of amphora that is from Samos. Um, though we're still working on the identification because it has some similarities to amphoras that Virginia Grace identified. However, she describes them as coming from the sea and perhaps they came from this site or another site in the area. There haven't been any kiln sites found in Samos. So it's an Aegean type amphora. And in there, we also have one other type of amphora that came from Lesbos. Uh, it's at about 45 meters depth. And uh, though we haven't found any other items other than amphoras on that site, um, uh, many other things. We found a grist stone that's there, a boat-shaped grist stone. And you can see the, uh, the wreck site uh, here in a 3D model. Um, you'll see these 3D models uh, in each of the, the rest of the, the wrecks, and they're made by Dr. Kataro Yamafuna, who's here somewhere. Um, Next, we have uh, amphora of, uh, or a cargo of Black Sea amphoras. The predominant cargo is Z72, and they're these huge amphoras uh, that uh, it's been a bit of a mystery as to what they carry. And this is the first wreck that's been found transporting these amphoras, so it's quite an important find. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's quite deep, 50 to 55 meters. Um, we have Pontic, Pontic amphoras. And, um, but we also have a minority cargo of these other types, including Capitan II. And you can see a site plan here. You can get that diver's perspective of the site. Uh, as with most of the wrecks we have in Forni, they crashed into the cliffs. And so we have these large scatters. So you don't get the perfectly preserved ships of the Black Sea, and you don't get the well laid out wrecks of Yasada, but we have these scatters kind of running down the cliffs. Uh, one of the more interesting cargoes are these uh, carrot amphoras uh, from the Black Sea coast. Um, it's a homogenous cargo of these uh, type 3 Sinopian amphoras. Um, uh, it's interesting, uh, George just presented a paper uh, on the Black Sea finds at a conference in Romania, and uh, the Black Sea cargoes are quite important to uh, putting together a picture of ancient trade from the Black Sea through the Aegean and down to the Levant and back. Uh, then we start getting into the late Roman wrecks that are along Aspercava. So we have one wreck that is a homogenous cargo of late Roman one. Uh, it's a, a smaller wreck uh, scattered along the rocks. Um, and uh, a lot of the wrecks are quite shallow, surprisingly. We do have uh, deep wrecks, but also quite shallow. It's, it's just they settled out at every different depth. We have a cargo that is a mixed cargo, late Roman 1, 2, and uh, we have two examples of late Roman 3 on this site. Uh, this is a much larger vessel uh, carrying a mixed cargo, and I'll get into a little bit about what we think uh, later on in a later slide, what we think about these um, late Roman wrecks. And finally, um, we have a wreck carrying uh, globular amphoras, probably from the 6th or 7th century, um, similar to the types carried on Yasada 7th century as well. So that's just one snapshot of one area, uh, but it's the, the closest concentration we have in Forni. But uh, broadly speaking, it, it's quite um, representative of the finds that we have across the island, um, where we have a, a large concentration of late Roman, as well as interspersed from different periods. Uh, most of our cargoes tell a story of networks connecting the Black Sea and North Aegean um, to Rhodes, Cyprus, the Levant, and Egypt, and uh, ships going back up that way too. So kind of connecting Eastern Mediterranean trade. Uh, but we also have long distance cargoes as well. So uh, this example here is a cargo of Africana II and uh, Spanish Amphora. Uh, it's our deepest wreck. Uh, it's a challenge to visit, uh, but it's quite well intact, and it's settled on a sandy seafloor, as you can see here. Um, so this is by far our, our deepest wreck that we found to date, uh, and also uh, an example of a long-distance cargo. So in the late Roman period, uh, we have this huge spike. So nearly half of all of our finds are from the late Roman period, and so this is uh, 
quite an important discovery. Uh, it fits well with other late Roman cargoes that have been found across the, the eastern, uh, well, in the Aegean as well as the eastern Mediterranean. And it tells this story of connectivity between Constantinople uh, and the Levant in Egypt, um, the pilgrimages that would go uh, in the early Christian period from Constantinople down to, to Egypt for um, cults like um, St. Manas and others. Uh, it also tells us something about uh, the politics, because Justinian um, focused his efforts on supplying uh, troops based in Samos, and so we think that some of these homogenous cargoes are on their way to Samos, uh, and some of the mixed cargoes are heading out from Samos. Perhaps we have something going on there based on um, the quester that was based in Samos. And uh, it also helps us address the archaeological bias that was first pointed out by A.J. Parker, but also... Um, explained to us by uh, Andrew Wilson most recently that uh, you have the adoption of barrels and um, so we, we see a drop in shipwrecks because they're harder to find as archaeologists we're looking for these amphora piles but clearly in the eastern Mediterranean there's still a robust trade in um, ceramic containers uh, into the late Roman period. So the Forney data set uh, presents quite a challenge. Uh, to be honest, we were expecting to find uh, two or three shipwrecks. We were not expecting to find over 50. Uh, so this joins several new large data sets of uh, shipwrecks from the Black Sea, the Dechka Peninsula, and Egypt um, that are adding significant numbers. And so we're, we're working out how to address having such a large data set, how to publish it and share it, um, and uh, disseminate what we're finding. So, we're doing quite a bit of analysis, so obviously we're doing typologies and content analysis, uh, but we're also going to get started on petrology and chemical analysis, and then our most recent, oh, and we're using photogrammetry, um, both for visual presentation of data, but also for volumetric analysis and uh, some reconstruction work. Uh, and our most recent Honor Frost grant was for paleomagnetic dating of amphoras. We're hoping that advances in uh, paleomagnetism can uh, help us to date amphoras uh, much more accurately than paleomagnetism in the past, so perhaps we can start getting some nice tight dates on some of these amphoras. So that's still uh, a work in progress, but uh, we have great hopes that uh, perhaps one day you can just send in samples of your amphoras and we'll be able to give you a date range. So why are there so many shipwrecks? Um, I'm going to go through this real quick. Basically, all the evidence we have points to Forney being a navigational point. So it's the archaeology of nowhere. There weren't any major settlements. There were a few small villages. Uh, there's some foundations of some larger structures in different periods. But for the most part, most part they're things like Hellenistic watchtowers for watching the channel and exerting uh, control over this important navigational channel. Uh, accounts, uh, ancient accounts as well as modern accounts point to Forney being a place that you would travel by. So if you look at this picture of Forni with Samos in the background, Samos and Ikaria, the west coast of Samos and uh, all of Ikaria are known for not having very good harbors. There's roadsteads, but not really harbors. And so if you're in this area, you want to travel to Forni because it's full of bays to put in. So it's actually a rather safe place for ships. If you look at this map uh, by Piri Rees, it shows uh, Ikaria at the top, Samos at the bottom, and then the channel. And so this channel was important for navigation uh, in every time period because Samos and Ikaria create a natural bottleneck. You have to go around them. And the central channel that passes by Forni is the safest. And if you actually look at this map, you see two ships with their sails down and at anchor. And these are the same two anchorages that are still listed in the modern Mediterranean pilot as the safest anchorages in Forni. So quite uh, interesting how mariners um, continue to use Forni in the same way. And you can also see labeled on the map is the watchtower at Jacano in Ikaria, which is one of three watchtowers in the area. Um, and they were used in the Hellenistic period for exerting control over the channel. So I am out of time. I'm just going to go ahead and say we're looking at the seascape using LIDAR data and uh, current measurements to try and figure out uh, and winds um, how these islands were used as in, from a navigational standpoint. We know that there are different trade routes that pass by Forney, both going east-west as well as north-south, uh, and that's why there's so many wrecks there. So we have a huge data set. We still don't know what the full number is, uh, so we're trying to work out how to best protect this resource, how to interrogate this data set. Uh, and so I'd like to thank the Honor Frost Foundation for funding us, as well as our other sponsors, all the team members, many of whom are here today, uh, for their work, uh, as well as Angeliki Samosi, uh, the Director of the Effort Underwater Antiquities, uh, for allowing us to conduct this research over the last two years. 
So thank you all very much. If you have any questions, I don't know if there's time, but uh, you're always welcome to ask George and I. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's impressive. Really impressive finds. Uh, I, don't, I know that you're still working on the material. It's very recent and you were there recently. But uh, I just wonder, just, okay, uh, we, we explained that um, why there are so many shipwrecks because they were dangerous waters. But have you done any spatial analysis to see if there are, I don't know, uh, where, uh, do you have any clusters in terms of date or provenance? or so that uh, you can identify some sea routes since you have such a good, statistically good material? We haven't yet, so that is something that we'd like to do, but our sampling method to date has been quite irregular just in terms of we were going to places told to us by fishermen and, uh, and divers, and so these are places that uh, it's not, it hasn't been a, um, a uh, what do you call it, systematic survey to be able to say something like that. So we have, from the points that they've told us, we've started doing systematic survey to connect the dots, so to speak. Uh, but that is certainly something that we will do in the future once we have more coverage. Thank you. Have, have you found any remains of the ships themselves? Uh, and, and do you hope to find that? And, and uh, what's the story on that? Um, because of the topography, we haven't found um, wooden remains, uh, but there are several candidates that have settled on Sandy Bottom and are excellent candidates for excavation in the future and may have wood remains. But for the most part, uh, it's mostly just the inorganics that have survived. Uh, but certainly in the future, um, if excavation takes place by um, groups, then, then they may reveal some wooden remains. May I add something to that? But basically, we have two wooden uh, ships uh, in very good condition, but they are 19th and 20th century, so probably you don't, you don't mean that, no. those ones. Yeah. They don't count. <laughs> uh, this is great stuff. It's good to see, and we don't, we don't see it enough, the use of peri reis. I mean, geography and history continue. Uh, it's very important and compliments that you're using this invaluable source. And we do need, of course, to be looking at this whole area from the eastern side. I was looking at Agathonisi, which was one of the offshore islands from Miletus. I mean, you need to look that way around. That's very important. But my question is, are we reopening the debate? I live in Oxford, but I still support Toby Parker a bit, my old, fr <laughs> my old friend from Bristol. No, I mean, is the debate continuing? I, I'm, going, I'm not going to say I think, I think this is a debate which will continue for a long time. I don't know what your view is there. Um, well, first I'll say regarding Agathonisi, um, Xanthi is going to speak about Agathonisi, correct? No? Oh, so okay, sorry, sorry. I'm the, so I'm the first of three wonderful papers about research in Greece, but uh, there's amazing research going on, and so hopefully uh, there has been work done at Agathonisi. Um, so I, maybe George can speak to that. Um, yeah, I mean, regarding the debate, um, I, I would guess that Andrew Wilson kind of reopened that again um, with his, his paper in 2011. But um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a huge drop in the number of wrecks in that period. Um, why is this? I mean, we know that uh, we have accounts of, of ships going back and forth, so clearly they're there somewhere. We find ballast piles. We find wrecks that are there that may have been carrying organic that are difficult to date. So, I mean, the evidence is out there. We just have these biases as archaeologists working with the material record. So, yes, I think that debate will continue for a long time. Uh, you said that the date goes up to 7th century AD, or you have a gap after, or not? Um, we have uh, a number of medieval vessels. It was just on Aspracavos in that section. It goes until 7th century AD, but then we have um, two wrecks from 10th century AD and one from the 11th century AD. That means that between 7th and 10th century, you don't have a, 
So there is this silence of the two centuries and the Byzantine history that the Dark Ages, as we go and. This uh, this gap is uh, is also on land, and that is important. If you got some uh, uh, testimonies or evidence in the sea to see from cargos if they are some uh, eighth century uh, ceramics or amphoras or uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may have you found trace materials in the amphora? What did they contain? Wine, oil, or whatever <laughs> almonds? Um, why don't we, we need to get on to the next paper, but we can discuss that. Um, we f mostly found things that octopus have pulled inside that are quite exciting, like lead sheathing and all kinds of stuff like that. So we can discuss that at length later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter and John. There are some seats available for those of you who need a seat. There are some seats all over. Next presentation is by Christos Agorditis okay, and Mirto Michaelis. We will travel back to the late Bronze Age in a different area of the Aegean Sea. Uh, during a systematic underwater archaeological survey held by the Hellenic Institute of Marine Archaeology under the direction of the speaker that has been carried out in selected areas of the Argosaronic Gulf uh, since 2003, a late Bronze Age shipwreck was located off the north northwestern rocky coast of Modi Islet at a depth of 25 to 38 meters. Modi is uh, situated at the southwest end of the Saronic Gulf at a distance of less than one nautical mile from the nearest coast of Poros Island, ancient Calabria. The rocky uninhabited islet extends about half a mile from southwest to northeast and its steep coastline offers limited access to a safe anchorage. Its impressive shape, like a seated lion, uh, that reaches a height of 102 meters above sea level, explains its second name, Leondari, Lion, and makes it an important landmark for mariners traveling around one of the most frequented sea routes in the Aegean throughout the centuries. The completion of the survey in 2007 and preliminary study of the surface finds located at the steep sea bottom of Modi verified the existence of a shipwreck that can be dated to the late Eladic 3 BC and that is the end of the 13th, 12th century BC. The discovery of overlapping, heavily concreted groups of ceramic ware, consisting mainly of transport vessels that would have been used for commercial purposes, bearing a chronological homogeneity, buried on a vertical axis, one on top of the other, uh, with the top finds being buried often upside down within the broken body of a larger vessel, led us to safely identify the cargo of one ship that would have wrecked at a specific instant of time, bearing witness on uh, how it would have originally been stowed. Inevitably, excavation was the only method treated in order to uncover the unhospitable and complicated environment within which the Modi shipwreck had been buried. Our arduous voyage of underwater research started in 2009 and still continues today after four excavation seasons with him as team as a crew committed to experience the geomorphological and natural hazards that once had proved fatal for the Mycenaean merchant ship which abruptly ended its journey at Modi. For the successful outcome of the project, uh, which is a complex no routine effort limited by time, budget and resource, uh, and in order to ensure productivity, safety, scientific grounding, and continuity through careful planning and preparation, we have managed to engage an interdisciplinary team, sorry, an interdisciplinary team, a proper surface support vessel, sufficient funding, 
and a well-adjusted diving plan. Overall, 93 uh, people have participated voluntarily with various academic credentials, divers in the absolute majority. Together with the archaeological excavation, a marine geophysical survey has been carried out in collaboration with the Laboratory of Marine Geology and Physical Oceanography of the University of Patras. Furthermore, we are collaborating with marine biologists in order to study the marine life at the site and how it has contributed to the process of sedimentation. During the course of the excavation, a filming crew operates with a team in order to create a documentary. The members of the team, through the years, have gained, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, have gained valuable nautical experience in order to be able to contribute both in fieldwork as researchers, but also to the everyday needs of a vessel as mariners. Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Pisias, a supporter of, the, uh, of, of our project, had generously offered his boat for five years to be used by HIMA. Agios Nikolaos uh, is a 20 meter long traditional wooden fishing boat at Rehandiri. However, before it could be used as the main support vessel at Modi project, it needed extensive repairs and adaptations in order to slave support an underwater archaeological expedition. Most of the work was conducted by HIMA's members under the coordination of Marcos Garas. The members of the team, as I told you through the years, have gained valuable nautical experience. Uh, the excavation. Every campaign lasts for approximately 50 days, out of which about 30 other days of underwater fieldwork. On average, one week is usually missed due to bad weather conditions mainly strong northerly winds. Since 2009, we have excavated 12 sectors, uh, all but three to the bedrock, this area here, up, down here. The geomorphology of Modi uh, presents peculiarities and obstruct and, uh, obstruct and delay to a great extent excavation. A great number of boulders have slid from the rocky islet on the sectors under investigation and have covered great parts of the ship's cargo. For example, uh, at the southeast area of the perimeter, this sector, sorry, this sector over there, has rightfully earned the name the sector of Hydrias. In 2010, a group of at least seven hydrias were found. During 2013, further excavation into the southern part of the sector brought to light another group of ideas with painted decoration in a good state of preservation. This happened mainly because the sector was partially sealed with a large limestone boulder weighing about uh, four tons that covered the great extent of the northern part of the sector and the, northern, and the other part, and the, it's, uh, the southern part of the adjacent sector. In 2016, we removed the boulder and another 14 partially preserved hydrias were recovered in this, in this area here. Furthermore, finds are recovered underneath limestone rocks. Uh, this almost intact skiffoid jar, M157, was located after the removal of a big rock that had rolled down from the isle uh, rocky islet and settled between three blocks, thus creating a shelter for this finely decorated and fragile ceramic. It was broken, but with all its pieces in situ. Through a rough estimate, we could suggest that 15 cubic meters of deposit has been removed so far from the excavation area. Bathymetry results have revealed that around Modi, the seafloor is steep with slopes ranging from 26 to 37 degrees. Often, because of the steep slope, a retaining wall of bags filled with sediment is necessary to prevent further landslide from the shallows as excavation proceeds. In addition, thick layers of biogenic concretions have been created throughout a large time span and have completely integrated numerous ceramic finds. 
Evidence documented so far strongly suggests that part of the ship's cargo has been buried underneath this rocky formation that was created at a later stage. Finds are always being revealed after great effort and working time, especially if one takes into account uh, diving limitations imposed by the depth. Excavation of the sectors mentioned above has reached a depth of uh, 0 0.6 to 1.2 meters. Before and after excavation of the sector. And here you get a picture of uh, uh, the, st the stratigraphy and the list, uh, different layers of deposition. Moreover, the excavation that was carried out on Modi Island by Dr. Konsolaki following the discovery of late Bronze Age occupation remain, uh, remains by Adon Iskiro has provided evidence for the existence of an impressive settlement that was founded during the late phase of late Atlantic 3B2 and would have flourished during the early and middle late Atlantic 3C period. Bearing this in mind, an intriguing problem we are facing with is the mixture of the archaeological material contained in the sediments deriving from the late Bronze Age settlement with the ceramic cargo of the wreck. As a result, great importance is given to careful excavation and detailed documentation of the site in order to date the wreck accurately and compare its cargo to the corresponding phase of the settlement on the island. A documentation methodology is being presented on a, po on a poster uh, upstairs behind the Trojan horse. The examination of the seafloor texture at the wreck site suggests that the seafloor characteristics were unfavorable for the preservation of wooden remains, be that that is as it may. In the near future, we would like to proceed with the excavation of trial trenches at the deepest part of the wreck, here. Probing has showed that thick layers of sand deposits would hold finds in good state of preservation. The finds. So far, it appears that the great volume of the ship's cargo is occupied by large maritime transport containers. Eleven undecorated 200 jars are recorded so far. Two survive underwater almost intact, and the rest in fragmentary condition. They belong to the same type with a few dissimilarities in size and shape. Jar aim M58 bears a relief and incised decoration of two parallel bands with antithetical triangles in between. On a fragment of a jar, an incision of linear B was detected of the T shape, which can be read as unknown liters of cereals. Their volume averages from 100 to 170 liters. The type compares favorably to jars from Pointeria Rec and other centers such as Prosimna. Uh, the Palace of Nestor in Pylos and Kanakia in Salamis, all dated to late Atlantic 3 BC, BC period. Two handless pithoi, all, uh, uh, one intact, were found also. Its volume is measured to 107 liters. It bears one relief band with a fishbone incised pattern on the junction of the neck to the body. Parallel evidence documenting context uh, at Mycenae. Uh, belongs to late Atlantic 3B2 horizon. 36 hydrias have been found so far. Uh, they have a globular or an ovoid body, raised base, tall neck, two horizontal cylindrical handles on the body, and one vertical handle from the rim to the shoulder. Often, their handles are pierced before firing within thin vertical holes. Three of them were buried within the broken bodies of the Judge M27, M58, as we discussed above. Their average capacity has been measured between 10 to 22 liters. Three almost intact uh, jugs have their parallels to vessels found at Mycenae and Asini dated to late Atlantic 3B and C period. An amphora, a small stirrup jar, and a lava stone, two deep bowls, a crater, and collar neck jar complete the typology of the ceramic ensemblage. Here are our statistics. And as uh, excavation progresses, 
the number of the artifacts will considerably raised. Among the miscellaneous ceramic finds, two partially preserved clay figurines, possibly of the whole Oopsie type, can be distinguished. A bronze blade of a knife or tool could have belonged to a member of the crew. Conservation has been carried out in the field and in the laboratory of uh, the F-8 of uh, underwater antiquities, where systematic conservation and desalination takes place. This process provide, uh, proved to be uh, energy and time consuming due to the nature and thickness of the concretions covering the surface of the finds, occasionally three times thicker than the ceramics walls. The conservators assigned with this difficult task gave their best and the impressive results reward their efforts. To summarize, <laughs> we believe that uh, the ship which uh, was wrecked off Modi would have conducted its voyage at a critical period when Mycenaean palaces and their central, centralized economies had collapsed and when the rocky island of Modi had been occupied for its geographical advantages as an important base on the maritime trade routes in the Argosaronic region and beyond. At the close of the 13th century, late phase of the Little Attic 3B2, the Mycenaean world changed radically due to natural hazards and invasions. Large -scale, inevitably, large-scale movement of people to somewhat remote regions fleeing from the administrative power centers marks the beginning of an era of restructuring at the dawn of the 12th century, Late Ladic 3C, Phase 1. Even settlements that were not completely abandoned were, built, were rebuilt differently, such as Tiryns and Mycenae. The occupational remains and imports of intrinsic value found on Modi suggest that some settlements even managed to prosper during the early and middle late Atlantic 3C. As it appears, therefore, commerce would have taken place between the Northeast Peloponnese and the Aegean. At this stage, we cannot declare that the ship was to continue its voyage or would have unloaded its cargo to Modi to be transshipped in a smaller vessel conducting a coast-to-coast -coast trading. Its cargo, consisting mainly of large transport vessels, such as jars, pithy, and hydrias of, of significant volume, most likely larger than the one wrecked around the same period at Pointeria. Here's the cargo of the Pointeria wreck, and exhibited in the Museum of Spetses, accounts for a medium-sized merchant ship, uh, an hypothetical reconstruction. Further research and study of the finds, currently in the process of conservation, will give us a more precise date. Additionally, provenance studies of the cargo through petrographic analysis are expected to shed light on the problems of sea routes and trade networks during this critical period of Aegean prehistory. We might be even be able to interpret the role that the settlement on Modi would have hold as an important maritime stopover and distributor of goods in the Argosaronic Gulf and in Gian in general. Before closing, I would like to uh, thank and say how grateful we are to our sponsors and supporters, especially the Institute of Aegean Prehistory, which they are supporting our uh, project for the last uh, uh, eight or nine years. And uh, last but not least, Nothing uh, from uh, what you heard and uh, saw uh, before uh, would have been accomplished without the members of our team. They all have worked. You can see the names of them on, on the screen. There are quite a few. They have all worked with enthusiasm, team spirit, and humor. Their dedication uh, is very encouraging in the difficult times we are going through. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Christus. We have time for one question. Lucky question, Stella. No. You won. Thank you very much, Christo. The site looks very different than the last time I was there. <laughs> you have dug everything. Um, not everything yet. <laughs> well, not everything yet, yeah. Uh, I have a question. You said that uh, the cargo 
is of transport containers. We've discussed it before, but I just wanted uh, to raise the issue again. Uh, because I don't think, or explain, uh, if you wish, why they're transport containers and not storage containers. Um, I mean, do you think they were transported full of goods or they were transported empty? Uh, certainly, I believe that they were transported full. Uh, there is uh, a, there is a discussion whether the hydrias were to be transported uh, as uh, containers and as ceramics for a change. So uh, that's why I was referring to transport containers for the big, large, for the large transport vessels, which are Pithoid. the pithoi and then uh, two hundred jars, hundred liters, hundred mm -hmm. hundred and seven liters. Of uh, from 100 to 170. Full of goods? Yes. Oh. Thank you very Almost much. Almost two tons so far. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christos and uh, Mirko. <laughs> Our next presenter is Xante. Argiris, okay. This is for you. Hello. Um, Lipsian Archaea Island complexes are situated on the southeastern Aegean east of Patmos and north of Leros. They are part of the Dodecanese group of islands. The large, the, okay. the larger Lipsi Archi Archipelago consists of 35 islands and islets, of which only three are inhabited. Three shipwrecks have been discovered in the Lipsi Archi area based on diverse reports. The shipwrecks located at Kumaros Cape, Macronese and Galapodia have only been preliminary published. However, both Lipsi and Archaea Island complexes have never been um, the focus of systematic archaeological research, whether terrestrial or underwater. They remain largely unexplored, and the role in any discussion regarding trade and antiquity is underrepresented. The aim of this presentation is to offer a glimpse of the archaeological potential of such remote and isolated islands. The two shipwrecks presented in this paper offer new evidence that direct us to reconsider the ways we perceive and, anal and analyze such places. This paper results from investigations at Lipsi and Archi Islands conducted by the effort of underwater antiquities in September 2010. This short, small-scale survey aimed to relocate and evaluate four reported ancient shipwrecks at Leros, Lipsi, and Archi Islands. Of the four shipwrecks, only two were located again, and they were preliminarily documented. The first site at Archi Island consists of a cargo of architectural elements, and the second, at Lipsi Island, contains a cargo of Cnidian amphora of the Hellenistic period. Our key complex consists of 13 islands and 10 islets, of which only two are inhabited, Arki and Marathi. It is referred to as Argie by Pliny and Arkitis by Agathimeros, a 3rd century geographer. In historical times, they were part of Miletus. The shipwreck at Arki was located west of Cape Kumaros, at the northern part of the island. It lies on a slightly sloping, sandy sea bottom, formed at the base of a rock cliff, at a at a depth of 43 to 52 meters, spreading across about 100 square meters. It contains architectural elements, mainly columns, and consists of two concentrations. The first concentration, at a depth of 44 to 47 meters, includes about 15 columns and presents some distributional coherence. The columns in groups lay par parallel to each other, and although the orientation among the groups is not the same, there seems to be a coherence inside each group. This relatively regular arrangement may also suggest the original stacking position of the columns. The second concentration, only a few meters away, at a depth of 47 to 52 meters, consists of 15 to 18 columns. 
The distribution is wider and the arrangement and position of the material on the sea bottom is more dispersed. The total number of columns on the wreck, about 33, is only provisional as there is some material that can be descended under the sand, alluding to a buried second layer. The columns are monolithic and undecorated. They are rough on their external side due to erosion and marine encrustations. The material is a kind of limestone, although it was not possible to determine whether it was marble. Unfortunately, the limited available time underwater did not allow sampling to study the type or the provenance of the material. No definite conclusions were reached either on whether the columns were semi-processed and finished stone products, although this seems the most probable. All of the discovered columns have the same dimensions, about three and a half meters in length. The diameter, about 40 centimeters, diminishes towards one end. Both edges are carved, carved flat, and it was possible to discern a kind of supporting band that was used to place the capital or the base. The cargo also contained some rectangular stone slabs, about two meters long, 40, meters wide, uh, 40 centimeters wide, and 15 centimeters thick, worked on at least one side. A proper calculation of the weight of the cargo is not possible given the lack of sufficient evidence. A rough estimate would be between 50 to 100 tons and would classify the ship among the relatively small stone carriers. An almost intact amphora was discovered among, um, among the columns of the first concentration, which was probably not in situ. The amphora can be identified as type D Sinopian 1 amphora, possibly produced at the Mirsi near Sinopi. This kind of amphora was used, were used to carry oil, although this hypothesis cannot be confirmed. The amphora can be dated between the early 6th to 7th centuries AD. Unfortunately, it is not clear whether the amphora forms part of the cargo or if, or if it is an intruder from a small concentration of five to six amphora of the same type that were discovered at a depth of 42 to 44 meters at a distance of about 40 meters south of the discussed site. Regarding the dating of the wreck, some problems arise. Unworked stone is not datable and there is no other material associated with the wreck that could offer a secure date besides the salvaged stamper which may not belong to the site. The monolithic and decorated columns suggest a late antique date for their shipwreck, roughly between the late Roman and Byzantine periods, 3rd to 7th centuries AD. A cargo of undecorated, of undecorated columns and blocks was discovered at Akin Lake Island, part of the Marmara Islands, ancient proconsuls, and was investigated by Negris, Negris Gimsenin. It contained 42. It, it contained 22 columns and fragments of columns and about 15 blocks made of Proconesian marble. The columns were much larger than those at Archi Cypric, measuring about 5 to 7 meters in length, the, di the diameter ranging from 50 to 90 centimeters. The wreck was provisionally dated to the 6th century AD. A study of 96 sites with cargoes containing so stone objects dated between the 2nd century BC and the 7th century AD suggests that, says that a significant proportion of the stone being moved in antiquity originated from quarries in the Eastern Mediterranean. Although this may be true, um, it is certainly not reflected in the archaeological record. There are 12 known shipwrecks with stone cargoes, excluding works of art, in the Aegean. I, okay, I can name them, but you can actually see them. Um, in comparison to only six from the rest of the Eastern Mediterranean and 78 shipwrecks from the Western Mediterranean. Basically, the data is. Now, Lipsi Island, referred to as Lipsia by Pliny, was first inhabited during the late Neolithic Early Bronze Age. Um, its geographical location favored uh, political connections with Miletus, especially during the Hellenistic period. The Lipsi Island shipwreck okay, was located south of Cape Armenistis, north of the Lipsi Bay. The main concentration lies between 39 to 44 meters on a sandy sea bottom, slightly inclining towards the west. The cargo comprises of amphora, which are dis dispersed in an area of about 140 square meters, without, however, retaining the coherence. 
There is no surviving evidence of the original position or stacking. The bulk of the cargo spreads over an area 18 meters in length, about 8, m 8 meters wide, which develops parallel to the coast. The amphora were relatively well preserved, with only, with only a few breaks on the handles, necks, and bases. This kind of breakage can, be often be, can often be observed in shipwrecks that have been disturbed and is due to the way they are handled in order to be retrieved. The size of the cargo cannot be easily estimated because of the likelihood it, it was widely looted prior to the survey. The overall picture and the water suggests that. It is almost certain that the cargo exceeded 200 amphora as the top layer, uh, this is widely looted, eh? Um, it is almost certain that the cargo exceeds 200 amphora as the visible top layer can be estimated to 180. An attempt to investigate, to investigate uh, whether there was a second layer of material buried under the sand through probing and small trial trenches opened by hand suggested that there are only fragments of broken amphora under the top layer for the most part, although undoubtedly there are a few intact amphora. This being said, the full potential of the shipwreck has not been explored. The ship's cargo appears to have been a shipment of wine, or less likely oil, contained in at least 200 amphora of Canadian origin, identified by their characteristic knobs. They exhibit features typical of the late cigar-shaped Canadian amphora of the Hellenistic period, with tall neck, small roll-shaped rim, elongated body, and toe with applied rim. This Canadian, this Canadian amphora variant circulates from the last third of the third century, all of the second century, and the first half of the first century BC, with minute changes in shape, but diminishing capacity over time. Traces of resin residue were discovered inside the salvaged amphora, supporting the transportation of liquids. Most of the shipwreck amphora were stamped. The salvaged the salvaged amphora bears two rectangular stamps, one on each handle. The stamps were illegible, although the lower part, which survived in both stamps, could represent, could represent a prow or a trident, typical of a later Hellenistic amphora. Taking into consideration all of the above, it is possible to suggest a 2nd century BC date for the amphora and the cypre. Besides the Canadian amphora, uh, the presence of some koan amphora with the characteristic double handles was documented. Al although it was not possible to calculate the precise number of koan amphora, it is clear it constituted a secondary cargo. The importance of Knidos as a center of amphora production and wine export is not clearly revealed in the Cypriot data. Eight Cypriots uh, of the Hellenistic period with Canadian amphora cargos have been discovered in the Aegean. And you can see them here. There are three in Furni and two, uh, one from Stir, uh, one from the Euboean Gulf, and three from uh, Furni Islands. The presence of corn and Canadian amphora in the same cargo is an often phenomenon. Now, the presented data is the fruit of non-systematic exploration, exploration based on reports of recreational and commercial divers. As such, the investigation was limited temporally and geographically. The available time spent on each site was short, and the nature of the research, its aims and scope, did not allow for a thorough documentation and recording of the sites. Thus, the available evidence does not allow for a balanced narrative that could answer wider questions related to the materials found on its, on its assemblage. Furthermore, the evidence cannot support a discussion on whether Archean and Lipsy Island complexes present a well-established maritime route or if passage was opportunistic to get shelter from weather. The assumptions expressed on this paper are limited and are based solely on a very restricted number of recovered amphora from each cargo. Archean and Lipsy Island complexes are nowadays considered isolated and remote due to a number of factors, the most important of which being the difficulty to reach them. It is important to, know that the, to note that the ways we understand and perceive remoteness and isolation in modern days is based on proximity to cultural and political centers and the distance from nodal points of transportation and trade. However, these perceptions are largely defined by modern criteria such as national rather than geographical boundaries and national policies. 
Such anachronistic ideas are often applied to historical periods, influencing our expectations and underlying the spatial focus, the aims and scope of scholars' research, leaving large areas unexplored. The Cyprix at Archie and Lipsy illustrate that the significance of, pla of a place is not necessarily analogous to suggested historical pat patterns, but rather the importance of some sites may be much larger, th much larger than what historical evidence and terrestrial sites indicate. The ongoing uh, survey at Furni Archipelagos uh, supports this assumption. The location of Archean Lipsi complexes on the maritime route from north to south, their proximity to the coasts of Asia Minor, Miletus, but also the larger islands of Patmos and Leros, and the topography and geomorphology of their seashores that offered protection from all prevailing winds suggest it was used as a shipping route in antiquity. However, there was little archaeological evidence to support this assumption. This lack of evidence clearly does not reflect sailing preferences or the choice of maritime routes. The discovery of these two relatively well-preserved shipwrecks at Archie and Lipsy demonstrates the great potential this area offers for further research. Thank you. Thank you for being on time. No, no, stay. We have time for questions. Yes, please. Katarina. It's not a question, it's an information. Very good you, you, work you did. Uh, you must add one dot on your map. There is a column, monolith, Antico Verde, from Poliegos, between Kimolos and Milos. Okay. There is in the F48, you can visit okay. it. And Thank you. Thank you very much. David Blackman, please. Yeah, uh, Ataki, could you have you have th your material is mainly third, fourth, but then you showed some amphorae, which, as you said, looked sixth, seventh. Is this? No, I said I said the third. Uh, you mean the the, the architecture uh, the architectural elements one? You you mean the archi the the ship with the architectural? I just said uh, th from third to seventh, just being very vague, late antique. I uh, I said and then. The the uh, the amphora uh, the Sinopian amphora is six to seventh century. The Gunes, the uh, Ekin Lake um, island Sipek is also sixth century. Okay, this. But then we are not sure about the amphora whether it's part of the cargo or not. So we take. The, so I have to be. I can't be precise on the date. <coughs> yes, I'm just. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much, Ksan. Thank you. Okay. Our next presenters are Damien Robinson and Frank Goudio. Damien, please. Thank you very much. So we're just going to have a quick trip to Egypt um, and to the sunken cities of, well, the sunken city of Tonus Heracleion, uh, which is just off the coast of, uh, of Alexandria. Um, and there at the western end of uh, a sacred waterway of the temple of Ammon of the Gareb, uh, a small boat was deliberately scuttled. It's not this one. This has nothing to do apart from the fact that it's a very pretty picture. Um, <laughs> It was known as Ship 11 to its discoverers. Uh, this vessel had seen a lifetime of work in and around the waterways of the port city of Tonis Heracleion, most probably in the, in the service of the god Osiris, which is why that's there. Um, Ship 11 was abandoned at a propitious location within the sacred geography of the city. It was carefully articulated with temples, shrines, and waterways, and it was surrounded by a range of objects that were clearly placed into the water as ritual acts. The boat was found during the investigation of a waterway known as the Grand Canal by the European Institute for Underwater Archaeology. Now, as resolutely watery objects, the remains of ships alongside uh, over 700 ancient anchors from the site provided this team a good 
first guess about the layout of the landscape of the city, and so ships and anchors were definitely looked for, uh, which is why we have, as Peter pointed out, about 75 uh, ancient wrecks at the moment. Um, so from its discovery onwards, however, it's clear that there was something very different about Ship 11, and it was one of the first two vessels fully excavated. Um, at present, it's currently undergoing post-excavation analysis at the University of Oxford, where the nautical archaeology is being studied by my colleague, uh, Carlos Cabrera, uh, while the ship itself remains preserved in situ in the waters of the Grand Canal. Should we try... Uh, so this is just the, uh, the sort of the map of, uh, of Tonis Heraclion, and the red circle is, uh, is the f location of Ship 11. So unusually for Tonis Heraclion, Ship 11 uh, was found on its own. It's isolated from the major groups of vessels that characterize the majority of the nautical assemblage of ships from this location. It was scuttled lengthwise across the western entrance of the canal, which passes on the northern side of the central island on which the main temple of Ammon of the Gareb stood. Uh, this island, uh, which is this, this big one here, uh, with the temples here, uh, was the main focus of uh, life in the port city from the foundation of the temple between about 450 and 380 BC until its destruction in a natural disaster in the middle of the 2nd century BC. And through the study of the artefacts in the ceiling layer around ship, over Ship 11 and also around Ship 11, uh, we can say that it dates to between about 400 and 325 BC, which means that the small boat was scuttled shortly after the central island became the focus of religious life in the port. Uh, so this is the, the ship itself. It's a small vessel. It's around 10 metres long by about 2 metres wide, and it's unusual in the assemblage from, of ships from Tonis Heraclean, as it's the only one constructed entirely from the sycamore fig. Uh, in ancient Egypt, this wood was thought to come from the Tree of Life and is very significant within Assyrian rituals. Isis places branches of sycamore fig under his dead body during the mysteries that surround his resurrection. The boat itself has a keel made up of five sections that were scarf-jointed together to which strakes were attached and fastened using pegged mortise and tenon joints. Uh, the shape of the hull is crescentic or sickle-shaped with very thin planking. Uh, into which the mortises were finely cut. And it's notable that there are far more uh, mortise and tenon joints in this thing than uh, were strictly necessary just to put it all together. Um, it would appear that the shipwrights who did this work built the vessel with the utmost care. Uh, they show off their virtuosity within their craft and its traditions. So it's not a roughly assembled boat, unlike the majority of the other ships that we have. Um, that are built to survive the rigours of an active life on the Nile and its delta. This one, by contrast to those, is a graceful and even delicate exhibition of the ancient Egyptian shipwright's art. The hull was also strengthened through a combination of 10 floor timbers with half frames and futtocks and at least 12 through beams that were fastened to the upper edge of the eighth strake and protrude outside the hull. Uh, the hull is corked internally and there seems to be some sort of resin uh, on the outside. Um, at the time of scuttling, though, the boat had seen a lifetime of service, uh, in, which can be observed by scratches on the underside of the hull, where it had been repeatedly beached or hauled out of the water. Um, the deposition of the boat itself was carefully done and involved its positioning and then letting in water through a hole where uh, the plank uh, of the keel had been removed. So it's this bit here. They took it out uh, before positioning it and then sinking it. Um, the watchfulness with which this was done and the location of the scuttling at the western end of the Grand Canal provides the first indications that the deposition of Ship 11 isn't a simple case of the disposal of an old and no longer wanted vessel. Um, the West has a particular resonance in Egyptian mythology and how they conceptualise their landscape, most significantly in the rituals surrounding death and the resurrection of Osiris, who was the ruler of the netherworld and who's frequently referred to as the foremost of the West. In the Nile Valley, uh, the crossing of the river from the habitable world on the eastern side to the embalming halls on the western side was the first stage in a funeral. The crossing was part of a ritual riverine procession where the tomb decorations, where in tomb decorations, the captions accompanying the images sometimes equate the boat carrying the coffin with the great ferry that the deceased uses to make the journey from the realm of death to Elysium, the place where they could live a blessed and happy life. And because I'm a classical archaeologist, we look at texts. 
So in a Theban tomb 347 of the scribe Hori, this ferry boat to the afterlife is captioned the Neshmet Bark, uh, the same name of, as the sacred bark of Osiris that was used in the mysteries of Abydos. And this is just a text that, uh, that, that says that. Um, in the ritual, the great decree issued to the gnome of the silent land, Osiris himself is aboard the turquoise Neshmet Bark as it sails away to the land of eternity. And this ritual was intended to be performed during the nocturnal period from the 25th to the 26th of the Egyptian month of Koiak. Uh, this was the culmination of the festival of the mysteries of Osiris, when the newly resurrected god was conveyed in a triumphal procession. Here then, the Neshmet Bark can be seen to play a role in not only in funerary rituals, but also in major divine festivals. And it's important to stress at this point also that there's no evidence from the base of the hull for any attachment points for carrying poles. And this would indicate that we're not dealing with a portable bark that would have been carried on the shoulders of priests during processions, but instead, Ship 11 is more likely to have been an operational vessel, uh, either one that carried the dead into the West and the afterlife, or a processional bark in which portable bark shrines and images of the gods would have been carried during the celebrations of religious festivals. Uh, so here's another uh, text. Um, and... In another tomb, uh, that of Aranesu, scribe of the altar of the Lord of the Two Lands, provides very clear information that links the festivals, and in this case the return of the deceased, uh, with the Neshmet Bark, and crucially in this point, uh, the sycamore fig tree, and that's the, the bit in red. And it's this conjunction between the finely made nature of Ship 11, its construction entirely in sycamore fig, and the place of its final resting place at the western end of the Grand Canal, which provides links between the vessel that we discovered uh, and the Neshmet bark that's perhaps used in the mysteries of Osiris. These festivals after death were celebrated in similar but different ways throughout Egypt. Uh, it's, the main, it's the archaeological remains of such festivals that were carefully deposited in the waterways of Tonis Heraclea that further strengthen our interpretation of Ship 11 as a bark sacred to the god Osiris. And here we can look at the distribution of Simpula, for example. Uh, the artifacts, both those deposited around Ship 11 and more generally in the waters of the Grand Canal itself, are not part of the everyday refuse dumped into the port. Uh, they're important because they help us to identify the types of rituals being enacted upon and around this waterway and the gods to whom they were aimed. Now, foremost among these rituals are a group of simpula. These are long-handled ladles that were linked to the festivals of the Mysteries of Osiris. Uh, these celebrated the resurrection of Osiris and were held during Koiak, which is the last month of the season of inundation, uh, which renews life in Egypt. Now, simpula, we've got about 120-odd of these things. Um, I say odd because we keep finding them. Um, these are repetitively deposited along the banks of the waterway, with their long axis in an east-west direction. And significant groups of them also mark important thresholds in the waterways. Uh, so there's one at the former eastern end, where this is the Canopic Gate, the main entrance point into uh, Heracleion. Uh, there's one, another group at this eastern end, and there's another group uh, significantly at the western end here around Tonis Heracleion, uh, around Ship 11. Uh, so... It's also important to note that the deposition of Simpula in the area around Ship 11 probably took place both before and after its abandonment. Uh, so it's important to acknowledge that Ship 11 is simply one component of what is a much larger ritual space. Joy, another text. Um, so the significance of the Simpula is that they're used in the creation of the Osiris Sokar statuette. This plays a major role in the celebration of the festival of Osiris Sokar on the night of the 25th of Koiak, uh, which appears to be, have involved a ritual navigation that uses the Neshmet bark, uh, which can be seen again here in this uh, particular text, uh, which is an Assyrian ritual adapted for private use in the second half of the first century BC. Now, the deposition of over 120 of these ladles into the waters of Tonis Heracleion to demarcate the edges and significant areas of the central port and the Grand Canal suggests that this was a particularly local adaption of the ritual. There was a long-standing one. The ritual intent is also clear. Through their use in the mysteries, the simpula, as well as other items of temple furniture, uh, were touched by the divine, and thus placing them into the water prevents the profane reuse. 
Occasionally, a simpulum was also bent deliberately, uh, ritually killing it before it was placed into the water. And this doubly protects it by rendering it unusable as well as inaccessible. So the links between the deposition of the simpula and the deposition of Ship 11 uh, are quite clear. Here, too, we're possibly dealing with a bark whose prolonged use within the waterborne festivals rendered it too sacred for the normal ship disposal practices that we see in Heracleion. Uh, there's another um, large monumental stella dating to 238 BC known as the Canopus Decree, which talks to us about another uh, riverine uh, procession from the, on the 29th of Koiak, which sets out from the temple of Tonis Heracleion and sails uh, a statuette of Osiris to Canopus. This is a three and a half kilometer journey, and uh, probably a larger portable bark would be needed uh, to go on this journey too. Traveling bark, not portable bark. Um, so a travelling bark is also represented here in the Assyrian chapels from the temple at Dendera, uh, which carry the symbol of Abydos, linking it firmly to the festivals of Osiris. And here the bark is decorated with the emblems of the gods who would have accompanied him, Anubis and Horus. And we also find these uh, emblems in the waterways around Tonis Heraclea uh, as well. Uh, some of them are small enough to go on models, but others of them are large enough to have gone uh, on the larger ships. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't find any around Ship 11, uh, which may well suggest that the ritual furniture of the boat is removed before it was uh, deposited. So it's been suggested that the place where Ship 11 was abandoned at the western end of the Grand Canal uh, was an important location within the sacred geography of Tonis Heracleion. The bow and the stern are carefully aligned with the edges of the waterway, um, and these, are place, these appear to have been places where people could also place offerings into the water. And many of these deposits, we get simpler, but we also get small offering dishes. Uh, and these are characterized by, often they come with a small piece of crushed lead and some animal bones, which suggests that they're all placed onto the dishes, uh, perhaps with offerings like flowers or so on, and then slipped into the waters from the, uh, the banks. Now, in contrast to the simpler, these offerings seem to be more personal in their character. So we have an interesting mix of both. Now, taken on its own, Ship 11 is just a small, finely made river-faring boat with a crescentic hull profile that's typical of many Egyptian vessels. It's the quality and care evident in its manufacture, however, together with its construction entirely in sycamore fig, that sets Ship 11 apart from the other vessels within the larger assemblage from Tonis Heracleion, which are generally larger and more crudely made working ships made of acacia wood. For a fuller understanding of Ship 11, however, it needs to be placed within the contexts of it, the, the wider ritual landscape of the city. In the journeys of the dead, the traveling festivals, and in the celebrations of the mysteries of Osiris in the month of Koiak. And it's these rituals and festivals that then need articulating with the material culture deposited around the bark and in the greater uh, area. Through these layers of association, it becomes apparent that Ship 11 is something more than a discarded vessel. It was ritually killed through the removal of a piece of its keel before it was, be before it was deliberately scuttled in a significant location at the western end of a sacred waterway and surrounded by votive offerings. All of these provide us with links to the god Osiris, to the dead, and to their journey to the netherworld in his Neshmet bark. So finally, I'd like to express my thanks uh, to the Honor Frost Foundation uh, to, for their support of Oxford's work on the ships from this port. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Damien. Any questions? Man? Damien, this is really interesting. Very, very interesting. Uh, uh, just uh, let me uh, get this right. So y you believe that the ship was deposited uh, when it was dry, when the area was dry, or, or, or it was deposited underwater? It's deposited underwater. Yeah, they deliberately sink it by taking out a piece of the keel. So th this is the main evidence, just the, the, the piece of the keel that has been removed? That's mm. the main evidence for how they sunk it. Yes. And then it's surrounded by these deposits of other materials. Yeah. And is, is this the only case in the area of a, a, a deliberately busted boat? Yeah. Because, you know, this is very unusual, mm -hmm. uh, uh, unusual practice in Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, depositing ships in the water. I mean, yeah. burying them, of course, but putting them in the water is very, very uh, unusual. I've, I've never, 
Yeah, this is really interesting. This is it. This is the in, in the seventy-five we've got. Mm. This is the it's only, the only one. one. This is mm. the only one that's that's sunk like this. Lots mm. of others are. You know, we have abandonment. Mm. We have reuse in mm. architecture and bridges and things like that. But this is the only one that's, and it's also the you know the smallest, the nicest made. Mm. The, there's lots of significance mm. on this one. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Just a short question. Uh, was it found empty? Unfortunately, yes. Apart <laughs> okay, then the next question. If you drill a hole mm -hmm. on, a, on an empty boat, mm. or you have struck the part of the keel, it doesn't go down. No, no, no. It's float uh, to mm -hmm. the water line, but it doesn't sink. That's why I think they remove uh, a big chunk of the keel first, in order to, and then, so they scuttle it. So they let the water in and carefully sink it. Yeah, even it, if you do it that, got, it's still floating. It does have bits of ballast within it as well. You know, there are chunks of rock. That oh, are kind so of it wasn't found empty? Pieces. Pardon? It wasn't found uh, empty. There, there were ballast stones inside. There were a few ballast stones, but it wasn't entirely... It wasn't... Right. Okay. It also it hasn't got any... You know, they hadn't filled it up with kind of ritual paraphernalia before they'd sunk it as well. Uh, it, was, it was just the shell. And then the ritual deposits are around it and at either end of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Okay. How thick were the hull planks? Uh, they, I could turn this one over to Carlos. Ha. Can you repeat the question, please? How thick were the hull planks? Two Roughly. centimeters? 20 millimeters. 20 millimeters? Mm. Um, and the lower part. Then the, the thickness increases when you go up to the, uh, to the hole. Okay, and were the mortise and tenons pegged? Did you find any wooden pegs in the mortise and tenons? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Our next presenter is Carlo Beltrame. Ladies and gentlemen, the aim of the route, route of a marble project is the reconstruction of the routes traveled by the ships transporting marble from the east to the west in the Roman period. The analysis of the marble traded through these routes, the evaluation of the practical problems with special transportation, and the characteristics of these ships. The shipwrecks along the coast of Sicily and Calabria are the main archaeological evidence used to try to answer to all these questions. The project officially began in 2000. 11, with the investigation of the shipwreck of Punta Cifo D, sunk south of Crotone in Calabria. Since 2014, we have been investigating the shipwrecks in Sicily at Marzamemi, Isola delle Correnti, and Capo Granitola. And two weeks ago, we concluded the mission on the Capo Tormina shipwreck. We document each site with automatic photogrammetry, which allows us to produce very precise 3D models of the cargoes and we sample each find of marble for systematic petrographic and isotopic analysis by the LAMA laboratory of the UAV University. The 3D digital models of marble blocks are processed by Elisa Costa and then used to make a virtual reconstruction of the original arrangement of the cargo according to stratigraphic relationship of the blocks, positions of their center of gravity, and ergonomic aspects of loading and unloading operations. Seeing the sites um, did not offer any evidence of a hull, these models allowed us to build a hypo hypothetical reconstructions of the ships and make hydrostatic and stability calculations proposed by the naval engineer Simone Parizzi to, speci to specify the minimum sites necessary to carry this weight of marble and navigate in safety. Isotopic analysis, uh, um, isotopic characterization of the carbon dioxide has also proved to be very useful in identifying the marble of Punta Cifo di Vrec. The provenance of the marble from all these wrecks was identified by Lorenzo Lazzarini by comparing the mineral petrographic and isotopic data with those published in the literature 
and from the analysis of query samples. Since the shipwreck of Punta Schifo has already been published, I prefer to focus my presentation on the Sicilian sites, which have been investigated thanks to the collaboration of the Superintendenza del Mare. In summary, the Punta Schifo D ship carried 54 blocks and mainly of mainly Proconesian marble, although one was of Dokimeon and two of Pentelic marble, which allow us to reconstruct a route uh, starting from Marman Island with a possible stop at, at Ephesus and also probably at Piraeus, probably finishing at Rome. The pottery allowed us to date the sinking to the 4th century AD. The Marzamemi site 1 is one mile off the village of Marza Marzamemi on a rocky bottom, 6 meters deep. It was investigated by Gerard Capita in 1959. The site is composed of a cluster of three presumed large Finnish columns, almost six meters long, four large square blocks, and three small blocks. Two other small blocks and a large column, 6.4 meters long, lie about 15 meters from the main cluster. Another presumed column is 33 meters away. Column 1911 is the largest block of marble found in the Mediterranean. Its weight is almost 40 tons, and its di diameter is one uh, 185 centimeters, which is the same diameter as the last surviving column in the Basilica of Maxentius in Rome. The other blocks are also of large dimensions and could be walked into column bases or capitals. Fragments of marble slabs seen by Capitan are no longer visible. Analysis uh, have indicated the use of marble proconesium for almost all the stone elements, while number six was of pentelic marble. The total weight of the cargo is, al is almost 153 tons. This weight and the reconstruction of the scattered blocks has allowed us to hypothesize a ship about 28 meters long, 9 meters wide, and 3 meters high to the deck. The discovery of fragments of amphoras capitan suggests dating the ship to the 4th century AD, with a possible provenance in the east. The shipwreck of Capo Granitola was found in, in 1976, close the shores of Torre Granitola, five nautical miles southeast of Mazzara del Vallo. In Purpura's preliminary publication, the site is dated to the 4th century AD because of the finding of a fragment of Captain Chu Amphora. The rocky sea bottom is covered by sand in, and is about 2 meters deep. The cargo is composed of 52 blocks of semi-finished marble partially overlapping. They are aligned in eight lines in a quite coherent arrangement, but many of them are broken into two, three or four pieces. The longest block is more than, than five meters long. Apart from this kind of blocks, on the south part of the site, three are, there are three marble molded bases. Um, isotopic analysis indicated that all the blocks uh, were of Proconesium marble. The total weight is 155 tons and the heaviest block is uh, 12 tons. This weight and the reconstruction of the scatter of the blocks has allowed us to hypothesize a ship 33 meters long, 10 meters wide, and 3.2 high to the deck. The fourth shipwreck lies about 500 meters offshore west of Isola del Correnti, close to the city of Porto Palo. The rocky sea bottom has little sand and is uh, 5 to 8 meters deep. The site was investigated in 1959 by Gerard Capitan, who could document a white current cargo of 40 rectangular blocks of semi-finished marble in four lines and with, with partial overlapping. Capitan calculated a total weight of 350 tons. The situation on the, si on the site that we documented in 2015, thanks to a grant by Honor Foundation, Honor Frost Foundation is very uh, different from what was documented in 1959. The more impressive difference is uh, at the center of the site where there is a large gap created by the removal of 10 large blocks weighting up to 20 tons of each. This is the most important robbery from an ancient wreck in terms of weight and dimension of the entire Mediterranean. Now only two, 25 blocks up to 5 meters long remain on the bottom. 
Isotopic analysis of all the blocks indicate proconeza marble from different locations, but two small fragments of slabs, which could be also remains of a different cargo, are probably of Carrara marble. Based on the specific gravity of proconeza marble, the adding, uh, the adding and adding the 110 tons of uh, looted blocks to the surviving blocks, we can calculate a total tonnage of 345 tons and a weight of almost 40 tons for the last, largest block. This data and the virtual reconstruction of the cargo allow us to propose a ship 35 meters long, 14 meters wide, and 4 meters high to the deck. Um, Africana, an Africana tape I, A, could indicate that in between the second and first century AD, confirmed by our discovery of a fragment of a common pottery Aegean jug dated to the first three centuries of the Christian era or later. In the first three centuries AD, large scale building projects funded both by the state and by private persons stimulated the demand of marble, which was a prestigious building stone. Decorative stones of huge dimensions became a symbol of wealth for private people and of power for the emperors. In the first century AD, the white marble quarried near Luni for the construction of buildings was replaced by Proconnesium marble. In the Severan period, the quantity of marble available at Marmara and the ease of loading it allowed the acceleration of a program of renovation of Roman cities, facilitated also by its coast, which, according to the Edict of Diocletian, was the cheapest of the marbles of the Mediterranean. A great deal of Proconnesium marble arrived at Rome, where it was used for the largest public buildings. Pensabene believes produ production to stock to be the simplest and cheapest solution, while Russell and Faint think that this was not no stock, there was no stock, and that the expedition fulfilled requests for specific buildings. The stocks, according to Pensabene, would have been organized in the main harbors, of, but especially at Ostia, where the marble arriving from the east awaited transportation to Rome or reloaded for transfer to the central and western Mediterranean. From the first half of the second century AD, Proconnesian marble, but also some Pentelic marble, were largely used also in the city of Leptismania, both for private and public buildings. This city was followed by other African cities of Cyrene, Sabrata, and Carthage. The blocks transporting the ships sunk at Punta Scifo, Marzamemi, Isola del Corrente, and Capo Granitola documented trade in the first century AD when this uh, commerce was at its peak. Also, um, in, in large semi-finished blocks of Proconnesian marble. Although we have to consider the exception of the free molded bases from Granitola and then transportation of thin slabs, the latter were recognized at Marzamemi and perhaps at Isola del Correnti. The blocks had a wide range of non standard dimensions. The probable identification of an element of pentelic marble at Marzamemi could be evidence of a small secondary cargo. The largest ships were the 335-tone Isola del Corrente and Punta Scifo D, which were in line with a tonnage of 50,000 modi, that is 330 tons mentioned in the digest, and with the cargos of an honorary of a large of the late Republican period. In the imperial period, the displacement of our ships, which could have arrived to 500 tons, was probably the maximum out there. Considering also both the big but not exceptional tonnage and the lack of a specific name, apart from a mention by Petronius in the Satiricon, which speaks of lapidarian aves, we have demonstrated elsewhere that they were probably not special ships used only for transporting marble, but simple, big and strong ships also used for other cargos. The arrangement of their coherent cargos confirms our idea that they were organized in a very functional way to save space and possibly carry a secondary cargo of light goods at the extremities of a ship. While the Punta Schifodi is evidence of the well-known route of the marble from the east to Rome or to the west in general, the positions of the Sicilian shipwrecks would suggest a different route to these cargos. Their position suggests suggest either a route which could have begun in the east, passing along the southern coast of Sicily, and then along the African coast 
perhaps to Carthage, or a completely different route. Since the use of Proconnesian marble was not particularly widespread at Carthage and in Spain, the destination of the two ships could have been Tripolitania, perhaps Leptismania, and the port of origin could have been Portus. In this case, these ships could, would have uh, carried Proconnesian marble from the large storage and redistribution emporium in Rome to Leptismania. Thanks to the direction of both of the prevailing winds and the main currents, the route from Sicily southwest to Africa enjoyed favorable sailing conditions. Ships could even navigate along the Tunisian coast or sail from Pacino with a north-south open sea route with a stop at Malta. They could, uh, concluding, pardon, concluding, the three Sicilian shipwrecks which, uh, with Proconnesian marble, could be evidence of a route traveled in the first century AD by ships carrying marble at Portus according to a model of traffic already proposed by Pensabene, which would have redistributed the stock of goods arriving from the east. But future research will have to evaluate some critical aspects, such as the task of double unloading of the marble, which on arrival at Portus were perhaps was perhaps carried a second time on other ships for the transportation to Africa. So we can say that the work for the reconstruction of the stories of these ships is far from concluded. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlo. Any questions? Gil. Many thanks, uh, Carlo, and um, a question from the perspective of the historian, if, uh, if you will. We're so used to um, looking at the anona and the grain trade as one that dictates the size of ships, the shipping routes, the depth of harbors, and indeed the building of new harbors, such as uh, Portos. But the grain is always going to one place from perhaps two or three places, and very centralized. Whereas this is something that happens on a larger scale, at least geographically, and has less flexibility. The grain could be shipped in smaller ships, whereas marble is heavier, more monolithic. My question to you is, can you give us an estimate of the extent of trade and the extent perhaps to which you can speculate about its effect over Mediterranean connectivity? So, so you're asking me if I have calculated how much marble was transported was it important enough in order to no, actually I, create... I made this kind of calculation, which I think is very uh, complex. I know only that in the first century AD we have this big peak of transportation, especially for the Proconnesian. So if I ask you, do you uh, think that the marble ships could also be used for other purposes? Uh, over van buildings? Uh, for grain, for example, or for the importation of other goods? I think uh, uh, that uh, on the extremities of the ships we are uh, reconstructing, there is a lot of space uh, which could be used not for a heavy cargo, so for a very light cargo, of course. So the space was available. Okay, there was another question. Yes, please. Thank you very much for your presentation. I wanted to ask you um, for the reconstruction. Okay. Sorry, uh, for the reconstruction of the vessels. Do you have any um, actual from the case that is used any actual timber hull remains uh, yeah. preserved? And if yes, do you have any indications of the thickness of the planking? Uh, not in these uh, shipwrecks we have uh, studied. Um, there is uh, only an element. Uh, yes, there is an element only in the Punta Schifo D shipwreck, which I have already published. It's uh, a, a whale. Um, in other shipwrecks we have seen, but uh, uh, when we find uh, the wooden remains, uh, sometimes we are very thick with a double layer of uh, mortise and tenons. So I, my idea is that they were. Uh, strong uh, ships, but probably not uh, dedicated, not special, uh, not dedicated for the marble. Any other questions? I have a small comment, Carlo, when you showed the navigation routes. I think I would avoid going through the Cape south of Tramina. I would go around the island, but that's just me. Uh, <laughs> what, um, in which direction? To Cartagena? To go south. To yeah, let's... Here. Yeah? I would not go... So you prefer the left... Uh, uh, 
proposal. Well, okay, yeah. we it's, yes, I, pro I, I think mm. so. But uh, yes, but there is also a, a second possibility. Yeah, but yeah, it's a possibility. I think for this kind of cargo, so big, uh, uh, slow uh, ships, probably the um, proposal on the left is much more uh, logic. This one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Carlo. You're welcome. Our last presentation for this session is by Christina Bazzano, oh, no. Timmy Gambin. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's you, Timmy. <laughs> <laughs> and Roberto La, Lo sex, La Roca. Yes. Uh, you're with the Mac people. I was told switching to Mac would be easier, but uh, it's actually much harder. So, um, I've got about six ways to kill you all, okay? First of all, it's death by thank you. I want to thank Stella and, uh, and uh, Lucy and also the Honor Frost Foundation. The second method is uh, death by PowerPoint. I'm beginning to suffer from conference fatigue, so I'll be as quick as possible so that we can get uh, to the coffee. So, this uh, story starts in 2010 with a systematic survey just uh, north of uh, Messina Straits. Is this the pointer, the red? Yes. Okay. So the idea was to survey the Messina Straits. You can see some uh, side scan lines over here. Uh, the idea being to survey zones of convergence. Okay, we know that the Straits were and still are very, very busy waterway, and also vessels would be uh, converging around Capo Peloro, Capo uh, Razocolmo, uh, to go northwards towards the uh, Aeolian Islands and onwards probably up to, to Portus in, in Roman times. The survey in the Messina Straits didn't work out too well, although we got some data, they are uh, not in the place where they should be because the currents were so strong that it was pushing our towfish um, all over the place. Anyway, we did manage to get nearly 20 square kilometers down, done, and in the process we identified about 80 targets, three of which are ancient shipwrecks. The, this one here is a uh, cargo of marble broke, uh, and, and other construction material. This is my favorite of the three, and perhaps I should have presented this uh, in, another, in another sitting. This is a ballast heap with um, grinding stones and also uh, lead ingots and nothing else. It's the closest, I've, and, and uh, two, two uh, anchors, it's the closest I've come to, uh, to actually being close to calling a grain ship, something sailing in ballast um, with, with nothing else, or with, other, with another organic cargo that has disintegrated um, over time. And we will be seeing more of uh, Messina 1, which is this, uh, this shipwreck here. It measures 15 meters by 5. Uh, there are the first one and a half layers that are visible. Um, and there almost certainly is at least one more layer which is buried. And that gives us a, a high chance of uh, finding, should it ever be excavated, which I don't think it will, um, a, a high chance of finding the wooden remains and possibly uh, ballast or a secondary secondary cargo and it the relief it's it measures about uh, 1.5 meters to two above uh, the uh, seabed very well uh, preserved there has been some damage by fishermen who an advert who have clearly found it o over time um, and so you do have some some clear breaks on the amphoras but otherwise 
It is a, uh, an extremely well-preserved shipwreck, uh, the bulk of which are Africana um, 2C, but there is a section of, uh, of North African, uh, oh, sorry, of uh, Amargo 50 and also, and also uh, um, Dressel 30. This is death by 3D. Um, we, we have gathered enough information to, uh, to create a 3D model where we're still in the early phases. Um, and because it is at 95 meters and we do have, uh, we, we have dived the site the first time in 2012 where, where we recovered one sample of the, of the um, cargo. And in 2015, we conducted a, another set of dives and uh, recovered another four, four samples. It's the Margot 50. Um, due to the encrustations we've gone to for identification, quite clearly Lusitanian, um, from, from shape. It is uh, grooved, I, I promise you, although the grooves don't show up in, in this photo, we recovered two samples of this. Two samples of uh, Dressel 50 also were uh, grooved, and they are so so well uh, preserved that we were not able to look at the uh, the makeup of the fabric. These were made both in present-day uh, Algeria, but also in uh, in modern-day Tunisia. Uh, personally, I think they they belong to the latter to to the latter group, and Africana Tusi, also from uh, from modern-day. Uh, Tunisia. So we have three distinct area of areas of production: the Amargo, possibly uh, the Dressel 30, although the Dressel 30 could also be here, and Nabuel for the Africana 2C. So quite a nice, uh, a nice mixed cargo along this route. I don't really like to draw, to, to draw lines, but the, the shipwreck is certainly found up here. So they're going north past the Egadi Islands towards, uh, towards the Aeolians. And then my, my belief is that go, they, they would turn northwards, and I will explain why soon during the, uh, a short film that I, that I have. Um, what uh, my colleagues have done so well is they've collected... Um, shipwrecks with similar cargoes, either homogeneous cargoes of the amphora, as I have just mentioned, or mixed cargoes, two or more of, uh, of the amphoras that I've just mentioned. I'm not going to go through, through them all. We have the, the, the paper ready and the stuff you can, you can read up once the paper is eventually, eventually published. So, we have uh, a shipwreck from the fourth century, you know, compared to the dozens of shipwrecks that are being found here, there and, there and everywhere. It's perhaps a, a drop in the ocean if seen in isolation. However, um, during a number of surveys that I've done on the western coast of Italy, the small islands are nearly always punctuated with these fourth century uh, wrecks, either a homogeneous cargo of Africana uh, amphoras or, as in this case, a mix. So, for example, one that I, that I worked on in Ponza, the main cargo are the Africana 2C, and there are these big globular amphoras, about, uh, about a, dozen, a dozen of them. So, quite clearly, there is this, this, this uh, heavy traffic going up the western coast using the small islands of... Uh, the Aeolian Islands, Capri, there was, there was one, one, uh, one Roman, oh, fourth century shipwreck found in the context of uh, Archeomar. There's one of Ventotene, one of Ponza, etc. Um, and again, if you take these four or five shipwrecks I've just mentioned and put them into um, the mix with all the various shipwrecks we've heard today in this session, and you place them in a graph, I assure you that the graph, no matter how it's been played with in the, in the recent past, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Parker's graph of 92, 
the shipwrecks match the graph quasi to perfection. So I think the debate is open, possibly just for the sake of keeping it open, because uh, no matter how how intensively we search, and I've covered um, over the past two decades close to 2,000 square kilometers with side scan and visited hundreds and hundreds of targets. Even if ships were carrying barrels, you would still find uh, elements related to the crew's, um, the crew's belongings, rigging, anchors, something, something there will be on the seabed. And I assure you, we found shipwrecks from the 18th century carrying sulfur, other shipwrecks from the same period carrying nothing, and we can recognize them because it's a, just a pile of ballast with an anchor from, for example, the 18th century. But they're there. And we've, we've looked over square, a square kilometer over a square kilometer. So I really do think that this quantification, and, and I not challenge, but I, I but I really plead with those who are finding multiple shipwreck uh, shipwrecks in, in certain sites to to quantify them roughly and see how they if they fit in the the, the graph um, at all. So on that uh, note, it's time for coffee. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> I scared you that much that you had to. Uh, time for questions. Any questions to Timmy? Uh, Pia? Uh, do you have any trace trolling or fishing on the boats? Um, no. Fishing, fishing yes, but uh, let's say trap fishing for, for lobsters. But trolling, no, because there are rocky outcrops. Um, having said that, I... I used to avoid areas uh, where trawling is practiced, thinking that you would find nothing. But both working with, uh, with Irena in Croatia and also off the island of Ponza, bang in the middle of a, a heavily trawled area, we found shipwrecks which on the surface, you know, you say, what happened here? But when you take a closer look and also realize that you're just looking at the top layer, which is partially destroyed or, or, or very, very disturbed. You know, the bottom layers and whatever lies in the sediment will be well preserved. But simple answer is there's no trawling in this particular site. Carlo? Don't make it difficult, please. So, yes, uh, my, uh, an observation about the, the observation you made about the visibility of uh, modern shipwrecks. I think you are right that uh, um, Modern shipwrecks are, you can find them underwater because you, there is something about the rigging, about the arms, for example. But uh, we are speaking about the 16th century or later periods when uh, you have uh, artillery aboard. I think it is more critical uh, the periods when they used barrel and they didn't already use the, the uh, artillery aboard. So I think this kind of shipwrecks, so 14th century, 14th century, 20th century are much less visible and they still remain a problem. No, some of the shipwrecks we have found have no artillery. They, you know, some have copper sheathing. We may say there was no copper sheathing in the, in the 14th century or before. Uh, some are just a, literally, a cargo of, uh, of bricks, of small bricks, nothing else. My point is, if, if you uh, survey systematically, and you cover every single square meter, and then you go back and visit every single target, I don't believe that these ships would disappear completely, unless they've been completely covered by Posidonia or sediment. Some kind of trace, some form of trace, they must, they must leave. Thank you. I would like to ask you if you feel the same way about, you hinted at the beginning with the uh, grain carriers. Do you, are you confident that we would find the grain carriers as well? For the Roman. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm well confident is a bit of a, a long shot, but uh, I, 
I, I sincerely believe that the, the Messina 2, the one in the middle anyway, the, the, the side scan image uh, in the middle is a, uh, a grain wreck. I, I have also come across other uh, ancient shipwrecks which are, and even not ancient shipwrecks, which, which have a minimal cargo and then um, the organic material has, has disintegrated. So it's very easy to be pushed towards the certain shipwrecks. And sometimes that's even tempting when we do broad side scan surveys. It's very easy to go to the easiest targets, you know, these big mounds which anybody can recognize. It's the question marks which really give us the, uh, the in this case for the grain ship, we were lucky because there was so much ballast and so many grinding stones that it really had the shape. But in other cases, you, it, it also depends on resources. How long do you have the AUV available? Um, if you have the, AUV, the ROV, sorry, if you only have the ROV for three days, then it makes sense to go to the obvious ones. But again, I, I think they're out there. It's just a question of, of, of covering more area and, and, and systematically checking uh, what the targets are. To finish, because even once you determine what a target is not, then you can shelve that and exclude that from, uh, from your list for, for future research. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Here we go. Thank you. That's yours. Okay. Thank you, Carl Bergman. Uh, I would like to thank very much the speakers of this session for their very interesting presentation. Presentations. Uh, before we leave for the coffee breaks, may I remind you that there are very nice posters which are presented here on the ground floor. Please have a look. Uh, people invested greatly in producing them, so have a look there as well. Thank you very much. See you later. It's okay. You okay? I was about 10 minutes. 10? Yeah, yeah good, good, good. I thought I scared you that we were. No, it's just everybody is tired, you know? Yeah, and everybody wants coffee. And... Very nice. Plus. And I hope what, you will excavate in order to find some this wooden no, remains, no? I, I, I work on a Phoenician shipwreck, which we are going to excavate in 110 meters, which is. Too deep for me. I'm not going. I'm not going. <laughs>